Thank you. So um, we'll basically be talking about how we um, rolled out Chef a little bit at Capital One, some details, and then we'll go through some best practices that we learned the hard way. So it helps the audience over here. Um, how do we sort of take a cloud and um, DevOps and Chef journey? Um, thanks for the introduction. Like I said, I'm Ali Rapji. Um, all of us work for the cloud engineering at Capital One, and we're software engineers. So jumping right in the presentation. Um, most of you over here, um, I think, think that Capital One is a credit card company. Indeed, we are. Uh, we are one of the largest in the US with 70 million accounts. Some of you also might know that Capital One is one of the largest banks in the US, right, and a digital leader in banking. We have some innovative and cool applications like mobile, most of people do have that, right, but we have an app called CreditWise, which doesn't just let you get your credit score, but it also gives you a model for your credit score. And then we have the few companies which can, um, you can, you, our customers can ask Alexa if, uh, hey Alexa, give me my account balance, and Alexa will let you know account balance and some details on the account that uh, somebody wants it. So, excuse me, let me turn this on. All right, um, some of you in the tech community also know us as um, contributors of open source. Hygieia, how many people use Hygieia over here? Or have heard about Hygieia? Few? All right, so Hygieia is a dashboard, um, which is one place that you can go configure uh, a simple visualization, which helps you to visualize your entire workflow, basically your whole pipeline, right? Um, I would encourage people to um, take a look at it. It's great. Um, Dev Exchange, which is a developer portal that Capital One recently rolled out. And um, that gives the ability of external developers as well as our partners to come in and access our APIs. That includes um, one of our authentication APIs. And then Cloud Custodian that we just rolled out, right, which helps, it's a policy engine um, which does AWS management with policy files and you can take actions on the resources running the cloud. For more information on these products, um, you can visit our GitHub site or our engineering site at capital1.io. Some of you might not know, but we are a founder-led 20-year-old technology company which started at a disruption in the credit industry. The company was formed on a premise that all consumer is in the United States should not have the same kind of credit cards. How we filled this vision was truly innovative. We took data technology, data sciences, and created the information-based strategy, also called IBS, which we used it for designing our products based on our customer needs and their lifestyles versus a one-fit-all model. We make adjustments to our products and our presentations to see the impact in our data. We predict business results before a full-scale market. We essentially were doing big data before the term data came in the picture. We are the largest digital bank in the nation, and the preferred channel, obviously, is mobile. We are changing banking for good and adding more humanity to banking. For our customers which are looking for the human touch and a smile, we have Capital One cafes where community can come together, know more about Capital One products, or a cup of coffee. Our founder and CEO mentioned Ultimately, the winners in banking will have the capabilities of a world-class software company. During the last four to five years, we've been focused on becoming a world-class software shop. We mostly built 
now software is in-house versus outsourcing. To become 100% agile shop versus utilizing the traditional waterfall. We build and automate our software deployments utilizing three major pillars. Automate everything, shift left, and dashboard everything. Our success in the software development was high, but adapting to these principles has helped us with faster app deployment where the timelines are concerned. So the question comes in, why cloud and Chef? Right? Who over here has not gone through the pain of building a server in the data center? I was pretty sure that nobody, unless the person started using cloud day one. But um, so most of us have gone through levels of frustration in building a server in the data center. At Capital One, we had a strong and robust pipeline as far as our application development went. But a couple of years ago, we realized that now for our developers um, to make sure that they had full capabilities, we wanted to um, start treating infrastructure as code. And this is where we um, got Chef uh, to help us out with config management tool. For faster provisioning and on-demand workloads, we started utilizing the cloud, and this initiated the next-gen infrastructure at Capital One. We started with a few pilot applications to help us with the reference examples and utilizing best principles of rolling in public cloud. We rolled out these applications, these pilot applications, having nothing in cloud at all to running critical production loads in the cloud in a very short amount of time. And Chef certainly was a catalyst to do that. Now we are focused on further how to improve our productivity, move quicker, get things to market faster, and continuously improve. We build our workloads on public cloud, leveraging open source technologies. We build using microservices architecture and RESTful APIs. Open source has definitely played a major role in our transformation. And today, we are an open source for shop. We build on open source, and we give it back to the open source community. After the success of the pilot applications, we accelerated our cloud journey with partnering, collaborating, and empowering our teams at Capital One. One of the tools that we utilized was a comparison of pipelines starting with a simple app deployment pipeline, which all the developers were already familiar with. The infrastructure provisioning and configuration used to be manual at that point. Right? With a simple app flow, developer writes code, checks it inside a code repo, the build job picks up the code, compiles it, builds it, runs some tests on it, and then moves it to an artifact repository. With infrastructure as code, similar to app as code, infrastructure code also gets stored in a, rep a code repo. The build job picks up the code, right? Builds it, run test on it, moves it to the Chef server, or um, if it's cloud formation, obviously. The so one of the examples we shared with our um, the application community as well as the ops side, that you can use cloud formation, roll out the um, servers, use Chef for structure, and use Chef to roll out the application code. That they can create the infrastructure, configure the application in a consistent manner in a few minutes. All right, so we want to make sure that we started creating sous chefs, right? We wanted junior chefs to be floating around as because there was tons of market, um, because everybody was excited. Right, because we had 
this burst of um, need from developers to understand, hey, how, how can we do that? So we decided to start with in-house training versus using traditional chef training um, to train all our students. We train PTs, lease managers, support staff. We also customize the traditional chef two-day training and made sure we started using our infrastructure as well as our pipeline. This helped that when the developer, after the two day, went back to his job, he basically acted as a sous chef, right? And they started coding and you started utilizing chef. We also focused on building reusable platform recipes and this helped traditional developers to just take it, customize it. We gave them instructions how to modify the environment variables, and utilize that five-star recipes that we had already developed. So how did we build a strong community? We obviously started using community of practice in the DevOps space and cloud architecture. We first where horizontal teams would be available for developers to be asking any questions and understanding if they had any concerns with the technology. Our product owners started running voice of the customers, understanding, talking to other product owners where they would get more information, how better to serve the internal customers. We have internal pulse site where people come and could say what features they wanted. And specifically, they could say, this process or this technology, the way the use of the technology is potentially technology goo, and we want to make sure that we removed it. At Capital One, we also have our internal stack exchange site where the community can share ideas. Um, they could post questions and tag them, and other developers inside can respond quickly. Then obviously, open space. So with our journey, we started with a standalone chef server and quickly moved to a tiered architecture due to our use case. But we realized that if we wanted to use chef as a config management tool with auto scaling and using the full capabilities of the cloud, we had to have high availability due to not giving our customers any downtime for our applications. Chef is working, we have, we've rolled out HA, but now we're working very closely with Chef to roll out a zero time downtime solution. So um, I'm gonna invite Ishu now to start getting inside a little bit of details where he'll share about uh, our pipeline, right? And then Surya is gonna continue um, getting in the conversation related to the best practices. Thank you, Ali. Uh, thanks, Ali, for covering the uh, over, uh, you know, basics of how we are doing uh, public cloud at Capital One, and and how we are, uh, you know, how the DevOps transformation is happening. Is it me? It would safely deploy the configurations, and if anything went wrong, it would stop what it was doing. Okay, so never mind. I'll just keep going. Site down with the bad so okay, so the uh, you know, for any developer, how how do you start your first uh, taking your first step? So you basically start writing your uh, code on your local workstation, and I think that's the fastest means to do it. So like any other uh, code uh, tool that you use, or any other framework or application that you do, you use uh, you know you you use your developer workstation. So in this case, we encourage our developers to use Chef. TK that was provided by uh, Chef, and you know to make as much use of Test Kitchen, Inspect, and uh, Chef Spec and Food Critic right at their local workstation. So we first encouraged our developers to. So yeah, so for the very first step, we uh, encouraged them to use Chef Supermarket. So for example, if they wanted to build a recipe, we asked them to just first check the supermarket and uh, whether it's private or public. So we also have a private supermarket implemented within our organization where the developers just uh, deploy and use their recipes of each other. That, uh, that you know, extends the power of you know, dependency management. So as soon as they used to find any cookbook that they can use, they can just use Workshelf to just pull down all the dependencies on their local workstation 
and spin up a Vagrant instance. So uh, spinning up a Vagrant instance was quite easy using Test Kitchen. So uh, once a uh, user just writes, writes their uh, wrapper cookbook around it and spins up a, a Vagrant instance, they can spin it, create it, destroy it, test it again and multiple times. So once they uh, feel very comfortable that their code is ready to go, we encourage it, uh, them to use our uh, Amazon EC2 instance to mimic the environment that they will have in the next stages, it's the production or QA. So, uh, you know, uh, once a developer also tests their code on EC2 instances, they would be pretty confident that, okay, it's going to run on the next stages as well. So, after that, they can simply baseline their code and just get ready for the next stage. Okay, so now developing on your, love, uh, on your uh, local workstation is always easy. But the next challenge comes when you think of putting your cookbook on a shared chef server. Obviously, we have a chef, uh, chef server which is shared by multiple uh, uh, developers and that, that brings in more complexity and few challenges around, around it. So, uh, like in a, uh, in a regulated company like a bank or a credit card company, there are multiple things that you should take care of when you are putting your code on a, on a, on a, on a shared server. So, one of those are basically how do you audit your uh, audit your code? How do you put traceability in your code? How do you make sure that the security is there? And you know, one of the most important thing is how do you maintain a code quality standard check across all the cookbooks which are being uploaded to your Chef server? So we had that already uh, built up for our application pipeline. But we when when we start thinking of infrastructure as code, we think it's important there as well. So how do we solve that problem? We first started off you know by putting our knife keys on our CI server. But guess what, that created a security problem because the same CI pro uh, server was being used by our chef, uh, chef developers as well. So how did, uh, then we thought, okay, let's, let's figure out another way. And that, uh, this way was that. Basically, what we did is, like you can see, uh, we created a center, central knife CI server where we place all of our you know, knife keys and other root credentials uh, uh, to utilize Chef Server, and we built a uh, reusable and cohesive pipelines around it, so that you know, developers can make uh, 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 API calls or even run them manually to just make, uh, uh, utilize them and just pass their own credentials or pass their own uh, information to the uh, common jobs and just kick off and do whatever they, uh, they are supposed to do. But obviously, we also introduce user accesses around it so that only certain uh, uh, you know, uh, authorized user can run these jobs and perform the activity. Uh, th they were allowed the amount of uh, information or accesses that they were supposed to have, neither less nor more. And once they were able to run these jobs, we, we, we also enforce the code quality checks within the same jobs and uh, so that all the uh, code across the organization is uh, following the same standard. Again, for, uh, now for the higher environment, let's say you want to put your code in production or uh, even in QA. We, we extended the functionality of you know, using approvals. So uh, I'll show you in the next slides how you can, uh, how the developers uh, also just entered the uh, email address for an approver or you know, any other information for the uh, approver. And the approver will get an email or notification where they can just pick, and uh, pick to either approve it or reject it based on its genuinity. Okay. So here is an example workflow that you can see here. Uh, here you can see that the u this is what uh, the users see on their Jenkins server. So basically we use uh, Jenkins as our CI server because Jenkins is obviously one of the most famous tool around the world for their CI uh, for a CI pipeline. And most of our teams are using Jenkins, so it was pretty easy to put our you know, jobs on Jenkins so that it was easy to integrate for the developers uh, to make app, uh, you know, optimum use of these jobs. It was pretty easy to integrate those jobs in their pipelines. So they either use these jobs as their downstream dependencies or they just made API calls to it. So for example, you can see we had dev QA and prod specified. The developer can just pick, okay, I want to run a dev job. So behind the scenes, we are, con uh, you know, they don't have to worry about putting information in knife.rb where the chef server is, and we will take care of that. The knife used to care of that on Jenkins server. They can just point it, point this job to their code repository, 
and just run it from there. Now, that was the uh, screen for an uploader. This is the screen that our approvers see. The approvers will get an email saying, okay, uh, this developer, for example, in this case, here is a name. I'm sure uh, people at the back can see it, so let's just assume any name. So uh, uh, the uh, approver can just uh, pick and choose and see, okay, this is the promotion that I got. Do, you, do I want to put this in production or not? So they can just execute or reject the pro promotion based on, an, on, on its validity. Now, one of the main reasons that we put uh, and build these pipelines was we wanted to put traceability and auditability. So we built innovative dashboards around it, and we, uh, you know, we basically fed all the logs generated by workflows to make sure that if our auditor comes into picture uh, tomorrow, he can just look at the dashboard and find out who promoted what cookbook and who uh, you know, approved what promotion. So you can use any number of tool you want or any other dashboard tool that you are comfortable with. You can even use Hygia as well, which is a great open source DevOps tool that we have, that, like Ali discussed in, in earlier slides. Now, to put it in all into one picture and perspective, this is how the flow overall works. The user pushes, uh, you know, completes all the development on his local machine and finds out if all the dependencies are satisfied, either using supermarket or any other dependency management tool. Once the user think, okay, my development is done, now I'm ready to put it in the sh on the shared chef server, he can invoke his own job. Now using his own job, he can invoke the remote job and you know just make an API call, or like I said, just run it manually, or, uh, and publish his own code on chef supermarket and on the chef server at the same time. I mean, it depends on you, but this is how we're doing it today. So once the cookbook lands on the chef server, the user can, you know, uh, either run a cloud formation template and just calls all the information from the chef server and configure their whole infrastructure. So this is how the overall pipeline looks like. So that's it from my side. I'll invite Surya to deep dive uh, to provide you better information and more information. Thank you guys. Sure. Hello. Can I use this? Hi, uh, everyone. Uh, like Ali and uh, Ishu said, uh, explain like how we uh, uh, went through this transformation using cloud and DevOps, and especially using Chef, and how we uh, established a workflow for our developers to use it across the organization, especially uh, for a large company like ours, where we have thousands of developers working on a shared Chef server, right? So uh, I'm going to cover some of the aspects uh, of what we learned over our journey. And uh, I think uh, these are few things uh, that each and every developer should keep in his mind before starting his journey or in his journey using Chef. So a taste of perfection comes with practice, obviously, and as we evolve into doing things uh, uh, in a repeatable fashion, and uh, we learn from our experiences and from our learnings, right? So we call it automation kung fu because kung fu is all about practice, and as you and automation kung fu is built upon similar lines of DevOps kung fu that uh, Adam Jacob pointed out last uh, ChefCon, right? So it's all about practice. It's all about uh, learning from your experiences and mistakes and building uh, better uh, recipes each and every time uh, you develop them, right? So one of the key questions uh, when we started with uh, uh, Chef is, what do we do with our existing automation? And what do we do with our existing scripts, which have been working and promising for us for over like many years, right? So we cannot just dump all of that stuff and just rewrite everything in Chef, right? So we need to hit the right balance. So some of the questions we asked ourselves is how can we leverage existing automation and all the investment that we did on existing automation? And then do we have to really design cookbooks from scratch or build a hybrid model in which we can leverage part of our automation, uh, which was helping us over a lot of years and Leverage the best which Chef has to offer, right? So that's the, those are the key questions that we asked ourselves when we started the journey, and let's see what we did. So this is a sample example when you port your existing scripts as is into a Chef recipe. It's a bunch of execute blocks running those scripts and commands that uh, you usually run when you run your automation through any other provisioning system, right? So the problem with this is uh, you, you don't have any control on what's going on in those scripts, 
I mean, even if you, I mean, it, it, you're using Chef, but are you really using the power of Chef, which is uh, creating an immutable and idempotent infrastructure, right? And you also lose the capability of, uh, you know, avoiding configuration drift at all. Because these resources, none of them are idempotent, or you don't have control over what happens to them when if you run the same recipe again and again. You have to do a lot of investment into those scripts to rewrite them to make it work, just to make it work, which is not uh, worth the time or cost, uh, especially in this new modern era when you have to deliver at velocity. So the advantages, right? Like uh, if you want to use existing scripts and recipes, as I said, you can kickstart your uh, Chef implementation and you can maybe put your application or deployment automation into production within minutes. But what you may lose is you will lose the ability to prevent configuration drift, which is the key uh, features of uh, the modern infrastructure. and you'll lose the ex ability to extend those cookbooks and create a, uh, a greater community of uh, open source cookbook writers. And yes, again, the, the main important part is item potency. You lose item potency. And, and that resource which, it, which is ported uh, uh, from your existing scripts, if it runs again and again, it may disrupt your entire production system. And you may run into production issues as well. So use resource DSL instead. I mean, this is an example of a recipe with plain old chef resources, uh, which are uh, which gives you the ability to easily read what's in the recipe and what it is doing. So any non-technical resource or non-technical person can go through this file and say that, OK, this file, this configuration or this recipe is installing Tomcat, and it's configuring it as a service, which is very simple and very easy to use. right? And any developer coming into your team, uh, maybe he is experienced with chef or he doesn't know chef at all. He can still con figure out what's going on, and he can easily use this recipe and write his own configuration on top of it, which is not possible if, or which is very hard to do if, uh, if it's if you're just porting your existing scripts into uh, as chef recipes. So we created a hybrid model uh, which uh, best suited for our ne uh, teams, and we partnered with uh, several internal teams to uh, get this. So the important uh, point in this is. What we did is we separated out our installation scripts versus our configuration scripts. And we thought, OK, the installation scripts can still run as is with properly having a guarded conditions. But the configuration is must, and it should be moved to Chef as templates and cookbook files. The reason for that is a cookbook, say, for example, Tomcat installation, will have its own configuration. And every team in the enterprise may have its own configuration. right? And we don't want every team in the enterprise to write their own Tomcat cookbook as. So we want to create one Tomcat cookbook with enterprise standards and want to give it away to teams and ask them to extend it. And the only way they can easily extend that is by putting the configuration into chef templates or resources, because that's easily scalable and easily overridable and easily extensible. So and one of the other things uh, that I want to touch upon today is chef search. So it's not most com un uncommon for people to use uh, a, uh, a config management tool like chef and build service discovery mechanisms on top of it. Right? Chef search is a nice feature, but again, uh, it's not uh, uh, giving you the real service discovery features or cluster management features. Right? And also, it doesn't uh, give you consistent results as well. I mean, it doesn't uh, take into account the health of the system. So it, if you can run a chef search and query the chef server to get all the servers performing, uh, which are part of a cluster. but you won't really get the status of uh, whether that server is healthy enough to take the traffic or not. You end up configuring that server, even if in, a, in its unhealthy state, into the cluster, and it starts taking traffic, which, again, is bad. right? So Chef Search is not ideal for service discovery. That's what we learned over our journey using Chef. And a proper service discovery tool like Console, HCD, or Zookeeper, uh, let service discovery tools do their job while Chef does config management and automation for you. And a clear separation between these duties uh, will give you a robust infrastructure. And again, uh, so I asked a developer, like, uh, what do you think is needed uh, in order for us to uh, write recipes perfectly each and every time? So one thing that he told me is this. We are evolving and we are delivering at the speed of uh, velocity and our requirements and our infrastructure is changing at very fast, right? So he said. If you want to uh, deliver consistent results with our chef automation or chef cookbooks, there is a need for automated build and test pipeline, without which 
you end up performing manual tests for the features that you've already coded two years or three years back. So the importance of a pipeline for automated testing is manual testing is uh, plausible and it is uh, effective, but it is limited. I mean, as you uh, add more releases to your automation, it's not really scalable or practical to perform manual testing. You do not want to uh, do 10 manual tests uh, for, a, for just a new feature that you added this cycle, right? You want all of those 10 old features to be tested automatically, and you want to just test the new feature that you re released recently. So that's the necessity of having an automated build pipeline. It ensures that your systems and configurations are safe and error-free, and uh, most often you detect the errors and correct them uh, very early in your life cycle or development cycle. So this is an example uh, end-to-end pipeline that one of our teams have built. And uh, uh, it shows the importance of having a pipeline right from the code commit until deployment, right? And, and the code, whether, regardless of whether it's application or infrastructure, goes through the same set of stages. And the same set of tests are run against uh, in the pipeline. And that uh, ensures that the entire infrastructure and the application are delivered consistently and faster. So uh, just a quick summary of what we discussed today, right? So building stronger communities is a must uh, for any enterprise that wants to transform into a DevOps shop or DevOps uh, uh, practices. And a standard workflow with, with best practices uh, ensures that you are uh, complying with your organizational policies at the same time uh, leveraging the benefits of DevOps and the new technologies that we're using these days. Dashboarding your DevOps gives you feedback real time, and that is a must uh, for your teams in, in order to uh, get feedback very early in the development cycle. And uh, you can, <coughs> excuse me. So automated testing is a must, as I said earlier. And you have to create delivery pipelines for your applications and infrastructure, just like uh, treat them both the same, because they are core, right? Infrastructure is core, and application is also core. And once you create and treat them together, and uh, flow them through the same pipeline that you use for your applications, you ensure that you have a robust, consistent, and immutable infrastructure. And finally, deliver at velocity and become a master chef. <laughs> uh, so at Capital One, uh, we are pushing the limits of innovation. And we are using technologies like cloud, DevOps, open source. And we are even contributing back to open source very heavily. Uh, we are building tools where uh, we don't find them, and we are uh, using the commercial and product, uh, open source products, uh, which are uh, which does the job well for us. And saying that, uh, uh, that's all. Uh, thanks. I'm just curious what you guys think about the Chef Automate tool, since it provides some of the visibility you have with Hygia. So um, we have not explored the automate tool just yet, right? So um, can't answer, or hopefully we'll be looking at it. Um, I could talk a little about Chef Delivery. Um, we have a, like, we started with the DevOps principle, so we had a strong, and I'm sorry, the echo, it seems something is messed up, but um, we have a very strong pipeline already, and so we decided to continue with Jenkins, and that's doing the job, right? Uh, once delivery probably picks up a little bit and has more features, we'll probably start going to be looking at it. But at this point, we're just using Jenkins. Have you published any information about how you've actually done the automation of Knife? We, um, that's one of the things when we were uh, preparing the presentation, it came through that we'll probably will be publishing that because that's pretty useful information, and we'll definitely be um, working on open sourcing that. All right, thank you. Let's give her another round of applause.